Welcome to the Web Platform Podcast, a developer discussion that dives deep into all things web. We discuss topics relevant to developing for the modern web and the web platform of today, tomorrow, and beyond. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Web Platform Podcast. It's 2018. I think this year the web is going to catch on. But today we're... <laughs> <laughs> today we're talking about Workbox, uh, developer toolkit for service workers and beyond. We are your host today, Justin Brown, Leon Revel, and Amal Hussein. Hello, wonderful people. How are you guys doing? Hi. Awesome. Welcome happy to 2018. Yeah, happy New Year indeed. The first episode of the year. Yeah, first episode and starting one... with the best API. Oh, yes. We love service workers, don't we? And it's episode number 150. And I have no magical thing, so... <laughs> That's the soundtrack from last year. So you know what? Because turkeys are cool. Uh, but before we get to our guest this week, we're going to go to Leon, who's going to talk about this week in the web in two minutes or less. Leon. Thanks, Justin. Um, so first of all, Henry Zhu, who we had on the show uh, at the end of last year, um, just published an article about uh, Babel's upcoming 7.0 release. Um, and that includes things, uh, what's new and what's coming. Um, a port of animate.css to the web platform, uh, sorry, that's the podcast, the Web Animations API is being created. Um, so that provides a long list of useful pre-baked animations uh, written with the Web Animations API, which is really great. Go and check that out. AmpConf is coming to Europe on February the 13th of this year in Amsterdam. Um, CCXT is a cryptocurrency exchange trading library, uh, which is available in JavaScript, which basically bundles a wide range of APIs for all of the different um, cryptocurrency exchanges into a single library. So that could be very useful. A blog by David Walsh entitled uh, Six Tiny But Awesome ES7 and ES8 Features um, services some nifty JavaScript features that you may not know uh, are on the way. Um, next up is uh, Angular 5.2.0, which has just been released on GitHub, which includes various bug fixes. And my personal favorite of this week's This Week in Web is the fact that Custom Elements version 1 um, are now enabled in Firefox Nightly. So that should mean that hopefully very soon we're going to have Custom Elements v1 in Firefox, which is very exciting news. Um, and that's everything from me for This Week in Web. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Leon. Yay, Custom Elements. I, I saw that tweet, I think, this morning at 12.35 a.m., so... <laughs> Yay for custom elements. And speaking of APIs that we like, by the way, we are talking about Service Worker and the wonderful library that is to, uh, Workbox. And our guests this week uh, possibly need no introduction. They are famous in their own rights, which they will deny because they are those kind of nice people. Jeff Posnick, Matt Gaunt, hey, thanks for coming on the show, guys. Thank you for having us. It's it's super fun. The first podcast I've ever done. <laughs> How is this the how is this the first podcast you've ever done, Matt? I I don't know. I was I was waiting for the the perfect opportunity and the perfect invite, and and here I am. Here and here you are, episode number one hundred and fifty, one hundred and fifty episodes in, and here you are. Thank you so much, guys, for joining the show. So for those who don't know who you are, which there are probably people out there who are just coming into the business, tell them a little bit about yourselves. Let Jeff go first. Sure. Um, so, hey, um, I am Jeff Bosnick. I'm on the same team as Matt, which is Google's web developer relations team. And uh, unlike Matt, I'm based out of New York. And, yeah, I've been working specifically within the team on uh, some libraries for service worker you know, tooling and making it so that folks have a nice experience using the service worker APIs for a few years now. And um, that's why I'm here. Happy to talk about it. And like Jeff said, I've been working on developer relations um, for Google for far too long at this point, um, out of London and now Mountain View. And yeah, I've been working on just the, the web for probably about three, four years of that, um, specifically around like service worker testing. Um, and then I started moving into web push. And yeah, just now I've kind of been working on Workbox for the past, well, since it was kind of thought up. So yeah. That um, that's that's amazing. Uh, and by the way, Matt, I I almost want to contest that you that we're not your first podcast because I feel like I've fallen asleep to you and Adi on YouTube, and and I say that in the nicest way. So that's kind of like a podcast, right? <laughs> I have to say that that sounds kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, so yeah, me and Adi do um, the 
the Totally Tooling Tips uh, series on YouTube. <laughs> No, it's, it's my job to make the corny jokes. Um, <laughs> but, but anyway, so, so we're really excited to have you on the show. Uh, and and we're, we're here to talk about Workbox today. Uh, but I, before we get into what Workbox is, can we uh, maybe discuss what service workers are um, briefly and um, how they've really changed the landscape of um, the web, web browser APIs and how developers uh, build for the modern web? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to jump in there. Uh, I think that the canonical answer, if, if somebody asks, like, what's a service worker, is that it is this background kind of thread that works as a network proxy or a proxy that could intercept requests that are coming from uh, your web page and do something before they actually go against the network. Um, so it's a little bit different than other ways of kind of spinning off different threads like just normal web workers and that a service worker has a lifetime that persists beyond the lifetime of the actual web page. So it kind of gets installed and then it hangs around for a while. Um, it's implemented in a way that's very event-based. So if there is no events, if it's not actually doing anything, the browser knows to kill it and not take up any resources. But then once you start using a web page that has a service worker associated with it, um, it'll the browser will know how to wake up that service worker and that service worker could start responding to network events. Um, it's also kind of useful for other non like network events, uh, like push notifications is also based off of the service worker specification. And um, it really changes the model for being able to run code and persist state that exists outside the lifetime of having you know a tab open on your browser. And um, I think that kind of persistence and that ability to kind of pre-populate caches and have those caches available later on um, without having to go against the network is uh, kind of something that's given service workers a lot of power and open the door for developing new types of applications. Yeah, the only thing that I was I was going to say is it, it, it's one description of service workers that I still, in my head, I have absolutely adored from Marico on our team, where it's like, if you imagine your computer has to connect to the internet, and let's say that's a satellite up in orbit, um, service workers is kind of like if you built your own alien spaceship and it could catch like these requests to a satellite and you could like completely change the network request before it then goes to the satellite, to the actual internet, and then you can receive the response and manipulate it even further before it then goes back down to Earth to your computer. Uh, I'm sure I'm like butchering this description to a certain degree, but... Yeah, for a less technical kind of um, depiction of it, it's kind of like this weird idea of something getting in the middle of network requests and manipulating them as they go into the internet and back again. That that that's pretty amazing. Uh, and I was I was I was afraid we were gonna like spend the entire show talking about that. So I'm really impressed that you managed to like, you know, so succinctly describe it. Um, so what what are some of the prereqs around service workers? Um, because there are prereqs like HTTPS, is that right? Yep, so you need to be on HTTPS, and I think, I want to say that's the only one. Obviously, the, the browser needs to support service workers, but um, the way you can think of service workers is very much like a progressive enhancement. Um, you don't necessarily need to rely on it, and you can, if it's there, you can take advantage of it. But yeah, I think HTTPS is the only one, right, Jeff? Yep, that would be the main thing. And, you know, HTTPS is a good idea for a lot of reasons, whether you're using service workers or not. So um, hopefully that is not a requirement that, you know, is too burdensome for folks. You mentioned um, browser support. Well, where is service worker supported at the moment? So that story has gotten better recently. Um, I think that most folks know that it's been around in Chrome for a few years now. Um, Firefox uh, similarly has shipped service workers by default uh, for, I want to say about two years now, maybe a year and a half. And um, Microsoft has made service worker support in Edge enabled by default if you're using the latest developer preview release. Um, I forget how they version everything. So I think it's not on the thing that everybody gets by default right now, but if you were to 
like you use one of the preview releases of Windows Insider or something, um, the current edge does have service workers enabled, which is super exciting. And um, I think a lot of folks have historically asked about service worker support in Safari. Um, that was kind of a bit of a black box for a while. And um, it's obviously up to Apple to implement that, but they actually have um, made some really encouraging steps uh, in terms of shipping service workers enabled in the latest uh, technical preview of the next Safari release. So, and now is something that you could go out on you know, Safari, at least on the desktop, and uh, try out and you know, see how much they've implemented. I think one important thing, um, you know, from somebody who's spent a lot of the time with the very earliest Chrome implementation of service workers, so like way back in like Chrome 39 or Chrome 40, um, there's an awful lot to implement. Um, adding service worker support to a browser takes a lot of time to get right and has a lot of moving pieces and touches obviously the network stack and it touches, you know, the ability to spin up threads that are independent of pages and adding the cache storage API and all these other things. Um, so I think with some of the other newer browsers, you might start seeing things where certain features and service workers are implemented in some of the technical previews and maybe not fully 100% of the API quite yet. But um, it's definitely been really encouraging. I think that a lot of people just, you know, certainly in our team, but in the web community in general, we're really excited um, in particular to see Edge and, and Safari show strong support for implementation. Um, that's that's super awesome. I, I think the day uh, the news came out about Safari, everyone was, I mean, I think Twitter kind of went haywire. Um, it was just a really great news for, you know, all iPhone users, um, you know, who really haven't been able to um, le leverage uh, a, a, the PWA experience on their phones. Um, and so... PW, and now, you know, mentioning PWAs, uh, service workers are kind of, it seems like the backbone of the progressive web app story. Um, and could you guys maybe shed a little light on that? I'm going to guess the question was, how do service workers fit into the PWA story? <laughs> I think that's solid. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, I, I think the idea behind progressive web apps is this notion of um, the web can basically have an experience similar to what what everyone would class as a native app on terms of like iOS or Android. And progressive web apps is kind of a step towards that in terms of user experience. So having the ability to have an icon on the home screen, the ability to open it up and then almost immediately see something on the screen that is useful and relevant. Um, and I think service workers is giving that same level of, hey, once the user clicks on this and opens up the web app, can we actually show something almost immediately? And waiting on a network request, waiting on a number of resources to download um, doesn't really give you an instant feel that you would get with native apps. And the reason they get around this is because you have everything that you need to just bootstrap the experience on the device. It's, it's downloaded when you install the app. So for service workers, by having an install step where you can install files that you can then depend on, um, gives you that instant, um, that, that instant experience. So I think that's the main part of the PWA story. It's not the only part. Like I say, you, you need to be on HTTPS, you need service workers, you need to have a web app manifest, so then you can define like what your add to home screen icon should be and splash screen. Um, but it's, I think it's the biggest barrier to, to creating a PWA for developers is just setting up the service workers and being able to do that instant um, opening of a URL and showing something to the user. So speaking of sort of that service worker experience as a developer, Workbox, uh, you know, service workers can be difficult to work with generally in terms of the amount of boilerplate you have to write and understanding how those network requests work. Workbox sort of fills that gap, right? I mean, what is Workbox from a developer standpoint? How does this make your service worker experience better? Yeah, um, so I think the idea behind Workbox is that we and um, you know folks who have actually tried building progressive web apps with the you know service worker that powers them have um, identified certain 
kind of boilerplate areas, certain things that most progressive web apps are going to want to do. Um, things that you could theoretically like copy and paste certain codes for caching strategy and maybe get things that will kind of work if you do that. But having you know, a copy and pasted service worker, having kind of something that's patched together and doesn't necessarily feel like um, a whole holistic experience uh, can lead to testing problems. It can lead to actual implementation problems. It can lead to subtle bugs that, you know, can, unfortunately, when you're using a service worker and you have it persist for a while, those subtle bugs could end up, um, you know, leading to a, a lasting negative experience. So the idea behind Workbox was let's take some of these things that we know pretty much anybody building a PWA is going to want to do, some of these caching strategies that folks will want to use, things um, that give you some control over routing and using different strategies for different types of requests, um, things like cache expiration that pretty much everybody would want to do but isn't actually part of the native service worker API. Um, let's take all that. Let's wrap it into a very consistent, kind of package that feels like you're using um, one interface to do all the different aspects of your web app, if you, you choose to use that, um, well, the service work for your web app. And um, let's also, at the same time, try to minimize the pain points that we've run into, that we know the folks in the community have run into, the ways of shooting yourself in the foot um, inadvertently. Um, let's make that as hard as we can <laughs> when you're using Workbox. Um, and part of that means we have some tooling um, that integrates into your build process that we encourage folks to use if you're doing things like pre-caching resources. So you can kind of hook into um, you know, your existing either like node NPM script based build process. We have a Webpack plugin. Um, we have just like a node API. Uh, and providing that type of way of shielding you against some of the ways things could go wrong and you can end up with this service worker that you know, ends up uh, not doing exactly what you'd expect. So that's kind of the value of, of using Workbox. Um, we just also kind of see areas in the service worker spec or things that are kind of adjacent to the core of using a service worker. I think a lot of people think about service workers, they think about caching. Um, that's obviously really important, but there are things like um, background sync API, for instance where um, these are things that are part of the service worker specification, but they aren't necessarily uh, things that have to do directly with caching and unfortunately tend to require a lot of either copy and pasting code or just struggling with the underlying API if you want to implement it yourself. So um, part of the other workbox story is how can we take those other things that you might want to do um, if you're building a PWA, like background sync, and make a nicer, consistent interface um, that just feels like, okay, I'm not adopting something completely brand new. I'm just adding in one additional module to the workback story, and everything works together really nicely and hopefully makes sense from the developer's perspective. So that's, that's kind of the, the value add, I guess, from using Workbox, at least from my perspective. So it sounds like um, that you know using Workbox makes it a lot easier for a developer to actually you know build something with the service worker specification and and some build tools and all those other kind of things. So there's certainly lots of pros there. Um, but just for completeness, are there any situations where you wouldn't use Workbox when you're dealing with service workers? Are there any downsides to using it at all? I would have said with V2, like the biggest downsides uh, downside sorry is um, the fact that that you kind of end up pulling in this workbox JS and it'd be this huge JavaScript file. And V3, we've done a lot of work to basically undo all of that in terms of if you're only using a small piece of the API, you only get the code for that one small piece. Um, I'm struggling to really think of a downside. I think the, the biggest criticism that we've had from especially people on our team who have worked with the service worker APIs um, is a certain point. So they're like, they want to get in the middle of it. Like they want to get in the middle of what Workbox is doing or just use Workbox in a specific chunk. Um, and again, V3, we're stepping in that direction where you can use the API in a much more flexible way. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say we're completely there yet. So if you have an existing service worker and you want to just like, I don't know, use um, pre-caching or you just want to use um, cache expiration so you only store 10 items in terms of images, um, 
I'd like to say that we would definitely work in that scenario, but I don't think we necessarily have a huge audience using Workbox that way. So if you are in that situation and you try it, like please do raise issues if you start getting sticking points. But I think that's the only only real one is if you've already got a service worker, you want one particular bit, maybe then Workbox is going to be more troublesome for you. But I think that's it. Yeah, I would just add to that that um, I think especially in, in V2, uh, which is our current production version of Workbox as, as of this recording, um, a lot of the focus had been on designing libraries that kind of all fit together. So if you were using our routing along with our like runtime caching strategies, that all should hopefully fit together very nicely. But that means that the interface, um, if you were just using only the routing or if you were just using only the runtime caching um, might not necessarily match exactly uh, what you would expect just from using something as a standalone thing. So, um, you know, we definitely got that from feedback, as you know, Matt mentioned, from members of the team and from other people in the external community and trying to address that to some extent in V3 to make it feel like something that you could use piecemeal without having like a really weird interface for interacting with it. Um, so it, se it seems like Workbox also gives developers a bunch of really good, smart defaults, right? And and it's really difficult to try to cater to everyone's use case. Uh, so that being said, um, is there kind of a plugin style architecture on, on the roadmap for Workbox, um, letting developers who want um, more specific functionality, um, you know, kind of hook into the existing uh, t tool chain? Yeah, so I, I think kind of two parts to that. Um, first, because it, it's really interesting, and Matt spent most of the time working on it. I, I, I want Matt to take some time to talk about um, how we're doing dynamic kind of library loading in V3, because it's pretty cool. Um, and then I could add some thoughts about um, plugins for Workbox, because I think that kind of ends up being interesting as well. But um, I'll turn things over to Matt. <laughs> I, I like how you say it's interesting because to me, I feel like I've just been crying over it and then it's all, <laughs> now it's done. I'm like, um, so, so you've been crying over it so that other developers don't have to. I mean, your, your tears have gone into Workbox and everybody can take advantage of that. Yeah, so, so basically, like I was saying, in the current production build, we have this one big JavaScript file. Um, and the biggest problem with it is we end up like, minifying a ton of class names and a ton of like scoping that just means that developers can't use individual pieces of the API. Um, so with V3, which is our, our next version and it's in alpha at the moment, um, what we're doing is the JavaScript file that you, that most developers will end up taking is nothing more than a very thin wrapper that just proxies um, the workbox namespace. So if you were to type workbox.precaching, the minute you you do that, the workbox proxy will then say, oh, you've requested pre-caching. I know what that is. So I'm now going to go and import the pre-caching module for you because it's using a um, particular path which you can customize or it will grab it for the CDN. It will then pull that in. And one of the nice things about um, JavaScript workers is when you're using import scripts, it's synchronous. So we can say import scripts, workbox pre-caching, and the next line, workbox precaching is this. So then we just return whatever workbox.precaching is. And there's kind of two really nice properties with this in that if you use workbox SW and you're pulling in the bits that you're, you're actually using, that's all you're going to download. It's just those individual pieces. It's not one big JavaScript file. The flip side is if you just wanted to use workbox precaching, you didn't want workbox SW. Um, you can just pull in Workbox precaching and roll up because of the way it sets up its namespacing. We'll just go, well, Workbox.precaching is what you told me to namespace this library to. So Workbox.precaching exists and that's it. Um, so there's kind of this nice modularization now where you either pull in this loader or you can pull in the individual pieces and the API is going to work exactly the same. And likewise, suddenly you actually have the class names, the modules, everything um, is consistent. And the extra nice thing with that is the code that we'll actually use inside the libraries is exactly the same as the code that you'd end up writing in your own service workers. So 
I feel like we've removed a big kind of um, wall essentially that we put up um, when using Workbox, which is super nice. So that's kind of the magic that's happening behind the scenes for the loading. Um, in terms of the plugin stuff, I'll hand that back over to Jeff because he's the one who's kind of uh, concocted that whole space. <laughs> yeah, concocted is the right word. Um, so I think that one of the things that we kind of saw as missing from the whole service worker kind of API, or at least when you start thinking about the life cycle of a request, um, right now, you know, if you were writing your own service worker code, you kind of have a fetch handler, which is an event exposed on the service worker, and it would take like this fetch event as its input and it would return response as its output. And within the lifetime of you know translating that request, that incoming request into response, there are a bunch of interesting things that you might want to kind of insert your own logic and customize. Um, and we took great inspiration, I think, from, I think probably the, the best way to describe it is like the React um, lifecycle events and things where, you know, folks who have done React programming might be familiar with like component will mount and, um, I don't know, component did mount and, and these various things that kind of allow you to wait for things to happen with components and then respond to that and kind of enter, add your own code that can then potentially modify the flow. And um, we wanted to add that to the process of taking requests and getting back a response. So within Workbox, we expose a few different request lifecycle events, um, like request will fetch or um, you know cache did match, kind of similar naming to, to what React is doing. And it allows you to either write your own code that will be fired off whenever one of those things happened. Um, so if you'd like, for instance, want to modify the URL um, before a request is actually goes against the network, you can intercept like that request will fetch and you can modify the outcoming request and then something different will end up being fetched. Um, or for instance, if you wanted to implement cache expiration, which is something that you get as part of a standard module that Workbox ships, but which is built on top of this whole concept of a request lifecycle. Um, all we're doing with the cache expiration is listening for, I think it's cache did update is the name of the event. And um, we are saying, okay, you know, whenever anything updates the cache within Workbox, let's fire off this custom code that will, you know, like take a look at the state of the cache and if it's exceeded whatever the expiration limits are, let's actually clean up the cache at that point. So um, we've found it useful internally in Workbox to have those abstractions and things like, you know, the background sync um, thing, plugin that I mentioned earlier, that's also just built on top of these abstractions where there's like a request did fail um, event that you listen for and then you automatically kind of wire together the background sync logic that gets um, invoked whenever an outgoing request failed. And um, it's been a really powerful abstraction Internally within Workbox, I don't think we've done a great job of explaining it to external developers who could, you know, then go and build their own plugins. But um, I think that is something we definitely would like to encourage in the future, and maybe have some more examples out there um, for anybody who's curious and just wants to, you know, maybe experiment on their own. Right now, um, just you know, looking at the code base and looking at like the cache expiration plugin and the um, background sync plugin are probably the best uh, best ways of taking a peek right now. The background sync plugin makes me generally very happy. Background sync is like just so magically useful uh, that I, I don't think a lot of developers have quite grasped background sync yet. I think it's still, you know, it's still young. Uh, but the plugin, which is, uh, there's there's a nifty little article on uh, developers.google.com slash web that we'll link to that talks about background sync with the plugin package. Uh, and we'll link to the repo as well. But, uh, you know, it sounds like this was just, I mean, I didn't hear a lot of tears in there. It sounded very easy. You guys obviously did this in a weekend. And, uh, you know, if, uh, you, you're almost to version three. Three is an alpha now. Is that correct? Somewhere around yeah. there. And uh, there's a lot of history. Like, you, we talk about Workbox, but before that, there was Service Worker Precache or SW Precache and Toolbox, uh, which sort of became Workbox, which... 
you know, if you were early on the service worker train, that still sort of exists. So you're trying to maybe move that way. I mean, what's that story look like now? I mean, we're talking about plugins and the new architecture and smaller things, and this sounds great, but if I'm on the old stuff still, what does my upgrade path look like so far as I'm coming from your SW-star sort of world into the workbox sort of land these days? Jeff, this is completely on <laughs> you. It, it's all your fault. <laughs> <laughs> it is all my fault. Um, so yeah, so little delving into history a bit. Um, so SW Precache and SW Toolbox are two of um, kind of very old school projects that helped with some of the similar things that Workbox does. And um, we kind of, we built those um, with a real world use case in mind. Um, this was around the same time that we were working on the Google I.O. web app in 2015. And, um, you know, it was really great to build these libraries, um, you know, not in the abstract as just a toy, but just like, okay, we need to ship, you know, it was effectively the first progressive web app. Um, and this is right at the same time that Chrome rolled out support for service workers. Um, so we have these problems. We need to do things like pre-caching. We need to do things like runtime caching. We need cache expiration. Um, the tooling didn't exist at that point. Most of the examples at that point were just, you know, writing things by hand. Um, we did not find that maintainable uh, in a real production, you know, web app where our assets, you know, had hashes in them and everything changed every build. Um, so we we built SW Precache and Toolbox kind of separately. Like I was working on SW Precache, um, a member of the team, Matt Scales, uh, primarily was the person working on SW Toolbox. Um, we we didn't necessarily coordinate as much as we should have, and we ended up kind of shipping two distinct projects. Um, we've tried to kind of bridge the gap in the interim and make it easier to like use SW Precache as the main entry point and automatically pull in um, SW Toolbox. But I think, um, you know, Matt Gaunt and other folks kind of said, hey, this is not necessarily the way a unified product should look and kind of got back to the drawing board and said, okay, if we were designing this as something that fits together that does everything you want your service worker to do, but has a consistent interface, what would it look like? Um, and it was clear that it wouldn't really look like what we had with SW Precache and Toolbox. It would look more like what we had with Workbox. Um, so that motivated us to kind of do the migration. There were a lot of other things that we wanted to add and flexibility that you couldn't get with Precache and, and Toolbox that we wanted to give developers. And, um, you know, I think that led to the Workbox V1. Um, we're currently on Workbox V2. We have a pretty consistent um, interface. We've we've carried over a lot of the concepts from SW Precache and SW Toolbox uh, to Workbox. So the naming for like some of the configuration parameters might have changed a bit, and um, the general ideas though are the same. Like you can integrate with the build process and generate a service worker um, with Workbox. That was the same thing you do with Precache. Um, I think Workbox gives you flexibility that you didn't have uh, to like, you know, more control over your top level service worker. So that, that's kind of like a new thing that you can do with Workbox. But um, I, I would say that the functionality is all there. Everything that you could do with the older libraries, you could do with Workbox. And the ways of integrating with your build process is pretty similar or similar enough that with the guidance that we have available, you should hopefully find migrating not too painful. And uh, the only thing that I'd add to that is I think to a certain degree, Workbox adds a lot more resilience to um, libraries like the SW Toolbox. It'll add consistency because I think at one point SW Toolbox had a method called precache and yet we had an entirely separate module, SW Precache, and it's kind of confusing why that would exist. And SW Toolbox version was very simplistic. It just wipe out whatever you had before and just install a whole new bunch of stuff. Precache was actually much more intelligent about it and would just say, well, these are the only files that have changed, so just download those ones. Um, and I think there was also an element of SW Precache would generate um, an entire service worker for you, whereas like for me personally, I didn't want something to build my service worker file. I wanted to create my own service worker. I just wanted to use pre-caching 
and there was no way for me to do that. It was kind of an all or nothing. So I think even though a lot of the feature set is very, very similar, I think the way that you can use the library is much, much more flexible. It applies to a much more like wider range of situations and uses. Um, yeah. So, um, by the way, this is like super fascinating to hear the history behind this project. Um, I think like living software has cruft and it has kinks and it has, you know, it, it has weird and ugly bits uh, because it's, it's all always a work in progress. Um, so it's just really great to hear um, the story. Uh, and so looking at some of the newer documentation around Workbox, um, the TLDR kind of doesn't even mention service workers, right? We talk a lot about caching um, and uh, just being this, you know, kind of general purpose, make, make your life happy as a developer toolbox. Um, so can you kind of maybe share some of the, like, I, I'm assuming this is done intentionally because you're hoping that Workbox is going to be um, not just associated with you know, painless service workers, but but lots of other uh, interesting things. I think you've pretty much nailed it on the head. Like we, while at the moment, everything we're doing is in the service worker, there's still the opportunity to add extra libraries that would help with the browser, the, the browser kind of side of it, the client side code. Like one example that we're, we'd like to do is add a library that you'd load in the web page that could sit there and say, well, actually, there's a new service worker loading. Um, here's an event to let you know. So you could signal to the user that, yes, there's a new service worker. Do you want to refresh or are you fine on this older version? Um, things like that doesn't really fit if we're only in a service worker world. Um, and plus, we, we don't know what PWAs are going to be able to support like in the future, maybe Workbox in the browser sits there and says, um, the option to add to home screen exists. Do you want to do it now? Or do you want to do a custom UI? Or what do you want to do? Um, so I think we're trying to leave it open to just, we're supporting whatever's needed for a PWA, because I think aspirationally, we want to leave the, the door open to do extra stuff. Um, but yeah, it's it's kind of an interesting space trying to figure out what people expect and want from Workbox because it's still, I feel like historically SW Precache and SW Toolbox, they've served a use case, but I think in terms of what developers kind of come and expect, it's always been a bit confusing to them having these two separate things and Workbox is trying to improve that, but I still don't think we've never like necessarily fixed it. I think that's a hard thing to fix. Um, as someone who's done that conversion from pre-cache and toolbox into sort of the workbox world. Number one, works by, as, as far as from a developer perspective, I think workbox is indeed way simpler to sort of grok and understand and handle as opposed to the two other systems, which while similarly somewhat named, uh, yeah, at, at, at points were vastly confusing for lots of people. Um, so I think the workbox story has continued to improve, which from a developer ease standpoint, I think makes it easier to sort of bring into projects where you know you need that service worker because I think to some extent the jury's in that service worker works pretty well. I mean, it doesn't, you know, the spec will improve and we will continue moving forward with things uh, from a browser development sort of standpoint where we'll get ideally nice things. But, uh, you know, from a, from a library standpoint and getting to work with those things, it is indeed very hard. I think that the notion of strategies and, uh, the things that Workbox sort of brings out of the table straight away, everything from analytics uh, to things like background sync particularly because I really like background sync. But uh, those stories, once you start getting to the use cases that people want to use in production, trying to cover all of that ground uh, and still be forward thinking is very difficult. I think you guys have done a really good job of that uh, over the course of things. Ah, oh, shucks. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> And, we appreciate and, that. And, and, and I'm going to make another another pun because um, Justin didn't realize he had like six puns in that soliloquy. Um, you didn't. You did a good job of not boxing yourselves in. Hey, <laughs> she's here all week, ladies uh, and gentlemen. Okay, no, no, no. Now, 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 serious praise. Honestly, am amazing backstory. Um, I kind of envision Workbox as being this this little like this kind of permanent. 
library that's there to kind of guide developers through the modern web experience, right? And and so if you have this vision of um, progressive web apps and 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 web apps in general, uh, you know, being um, more enriched with with um, with these kind of interesting web APIs, you know, Workbox kind of I think helps ease. Um, I think it can kind of ease developers into using um, new features, right? And and progressively also supporting new features uh, and trying them without, you know, um, with less trepidation, you know? So that's kind of really interesting. I think it definitely, sure. I was going to say, it definitely feels like it plays into the whole, the, the web manifesto style of, of kind of writing specs where they're incredibly low level with the, expectation that you're going to build libraries to then kind of abstract away. I think the interesting thing is going to be whether Workbox changes over time to take advantage of new web standards that basically do a lot of the work for us um, because it's a common pattern that people are doing or whether it, there is always this kind of consistent need for a set of libraries like Workbox. Yeah, and I was going to say, I, I think we certainly want to be careful about not letting the scope of Workbox go crazy. Um, I think, you know, the real sweet spot is let's see if there are patterns that um, people who are building real world progressive web apps keep, you know, following again and again. Um, and, you know, instead of just going to the canonical blog post from Jake Archibald and copying and pasting the code, um, how can we take those types of things and wrap them in a consistent interface so that you don't have to Write it yourself. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to make sure it's tested cross browsers. Um, you just feel comfortable using those building blocks. And that's kind of the real sweet spot for Workbox. So speaking of patterns, the copy paste story, you know, which I think was, I, you know, I think we all did it. I think, I, I don't know anyone who didn't start with service workers who didn't paste stuff out of J uh, Jake's blog post. Uh, I feel like that, I feel like that was the conical start to, oh, I want to use a service worker. I wonder if this will work. Uh, but in terms of use cases and strategies, uh, what kind of strat what kind of strategies are you guys seeing in the field? Like, you know, we know that you know there's pre caching, for instance. Uh, you know, uh, do you see a lot of uh, cache first strategies out there these days? Because I know that for certain things, there are low hanging sort of performance fruits that you can get with a progressive enhancement. I mean, I think the cache first strategy for immutable images, for instance, works quite lovely um, when you know certain you know know things about the way your application works, but. I mean, what kind of strategy are you guys seeing out there, and what kind of strategies is Workbox looking uh, looking towards today? Um, sure, I, I can feel that one. I think um, you know it's it's an interesting question. So I, you kind of started by talking about the copy and paste and just taking um, you know like a cash for a strategy and pasting into your own service worker. And not necessarily understanding that it is even a cash for strategy. Like there's no, you know, there is no part of the code when you look at this composed like series of cache storage API calls and fetch API calls where it, it screams, hey, I am cache first. True. Um, and I'm, <laughs> and I'm, and I'm going to keep caching things. And, and more to the point, you know, I never update once I, once I cache things. A common problem um, I hear for some folks. Yes. So uh, I think part of what Workbox does is like we we will take the same underlying code, but we will call it you know we expose like Workbox dot strategies dash sorry dot cache first, and it's very upfront in that way that you say okay, this is a cache first strategy. Um, you could still end up applying it inadvertently to more than you expect. You know if you mess up your routing, um, you know start serving your index.html cache first and indefinitely and end up in a bad place. Um, I think Workbox's debugging helps a little bit there, but also I think just the fact that, you know, this is labeled a cache for a strategy, and then maybe you will start thinking, hey, do I really want to serve my index.html cache first? And you're like, no, actually, something more like stale while revalidate, which is one of the other strategies we support, or network first, um, might end up making more sense. So it's kind of taking the few pieces of cache storage and fetch API code, packaging them up in a, and putting a label to them that you could then use when you rationalize about your overall service worker. And, um, you know, it's really interesting. Like if you're in a production web app, you're probably going to be using a mix of, you know, pre-caching for certain local resources. You can probably use runtime caching for things that are like API requests or maybe dynamic image requests that aren't used on every page. 
And I think one of the really nice things about using Workbox for that scenario is that if you look at your the code that you'll probably end up writing, um, it's first of all, it's not going to be very long. Um, you could probably get away with that in you know, something like 20 lines of your own code. Um, and it should give you a nice mapping of just like, okay, I have some pre-caching here that corresponds to this call. I have like these three different routes that I've set up and here's the URL patterns I'm using, you know, for my API routes and very explicitly like I'm using a stale while revalidate strategy for that. And you start thinking about things kind of as higher level concepts and start thinking about these for this class of resources, I'm absolutely fine with using a cache for a strategy because I know they're immutable images. But at the same time, because I don't want to cache a thousand images on each um, user's device when they navigate to a thousand different pages, I'm going to also start limiting the number of images I actually save. Um, and Workbox really gives you that way of thinking about each kind of individual route in a logical, complete fashion that um, I think is a real advantage in real world applications. So that's that's kind of what we were going for. Um, and hopefully, hopefully it worked together with the debugging information that we provide. I will also say we now have a common recipes documentation page, which does random things like Google fonts and caching images and all that stuff. So that's stuff that Adi Osmani has put together in terms of what he's seen in the field. So we are seeing some common patterns just sort of play out. I think the real interesting thing will be if people start doing like templating inside the service worker and then what caching strategies you use and how you define it and bring everything together. Um, but I haven't seen too many people do that super reliably yet. I think great, great segue into debugging. I know, I know Leon had some burning questions about debugging. Um, no, just really wanted to ask, uh, like if so, it sounds like um, Workbox obviously does a lot to make you uh, make it easy to get things done with Service Worker. But what about when things go wrong? Does does Workbox help with with debugging anyway, making it easier to reason about what's going on, or what's the story there? If you could just give us some information on that, it actually tries its hardest just to make things as horrible as possible. Um, no, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> Just like a proper I was library. Genuinely, I was genuinely concerned then the way I said that and then no one responded. I was like, oh, they believe me? No. Um, so I think historically people have used this and at and Workbox. I think in, in the very early days, we tried to make debugging a little bit nicer, but it wasn't. it wasn't very consistent. It, it wasn't really prioritized. And in V3 we've basically spent a lot of time basically trying to make this as, as good as humanly possible. And we've also spent a lot of time making sure our build process um, can output dev and prod builds, which means that for the developer builds, there is a ton of logging now. Um, we make extensive use of the console in terms of the varying levels of debug, log, um, et cetera. Uh, so now when you actually start using Workbox, you'll actually see a ton of messages that are literally like, oh, this is the request that came in. Um, we found the route that will match it. We're going to use a cache first strategy. And then it will go, well, actually, it's not in the cache. We're going to go get it from the network. Or actually, it is in the cache, so that's what we're going to return. So now there's kind of a much nicer story in terms of, OK, this is what the service worker received, and this is how it's handled it. Um, whereas before, or if you're writing your own service worker code, there's a certain degree of, well, a request came in and this is a response and you'd kind of be left to your own devices to figure out, well, did it actually hit the service worker? Is it not registered yet? What did the service worker do with it? What, a, what exactly is the end result coming from? Is the network or the cache? I still don't know. Um, so I think Workbox is definitely trying to help there because it's probably one of the biggest pain points for anyone who starts working with service workers is trying to understand what's happening. Um, I definitely would like to see us do a bit more work in terms of in the actual web page, like what's happening when you register a service worker is especially around like, is the page currently being controlled by the service worker or is it not? Which is the one that at the moment I'm getting a lot of requests um, for help for. So there's still more that we can do, but yeah, I, I think V3 is definitely going to help a lot in terms of people figuring out what's going on. Yeah, and Matt's being pretty modest here. Um, he worked on a lot of the logging code in V3, and I think 
I mean, it's really fantastic. Um, I can say that because I had very little to do with it. And I think one of the pain points that we saw with the earlier versions of Workbox is that, you know, while we did try to do some logging, we were also very conscious about splitting up logging code in our dev bundles, and we had a separate prod bundle, and it was really kind of hard to switch between the two. Um, the stuff that we talked about earlier with dynamic kind of import scripts pulling in the appropriate bundles at runtime also means that we could do things like have um, a check at startup that says, hey, if I'm running in localhost, then I'm always going to pull in the dev bundles, and um, you're going to have a really fantastic logging experience with lots of information during local development, and then um, you know not have to do anything magic in order to get a optimized production environment and not spam you know the users console logs in production. So I think it's a really great experience, um, and there's some cool stuff that Matt's done with like grouping together entries and trying to show the most relevant stuff and hiding other things behind like a collapsible section in the DevTools logs. So um, Definitely try out V3, and hopefully folks will be happy. I'd also like to say thank you to the browser engineers uh, over at Firefox and Edge who, the minute I started complaining about random issues in different browsers, um, they very quickly fixed it, which meant that I could actually move forward with my grouping and coloring of log messages um, without any issues. So shout out to those guys. Mm -hmm. Colored log files in the console and icons and emojis is obviously the most important thing you can possibly worry about. <laughs> you, you can't have a good library without those things. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it sounds like you guys are doing a lot in terms of debugging and stuff, which is really great to hear. Um, obviously, it's really important, especially you know when you get stuck on something and having the right tools available to really figure out what's going on is, is really important. Um, so just kind of more, more of a generic question. So is, is Workbox something that people are using in production already? Um, um, it, if so, who are those people? Anything kind of around that area? So, sure. I can, no, go, Jeff. I'll, I'll let Matt. Okay, sure. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we have seen some uptick in Workbox uh, usage and production from you know sites that you probably have heard of. Um, a lot of these, you know, I'm, I always in the back of my head, I'm like, who can we talk about? Um, and uh, we made a few announcements at the Chrome Dev Summit a few months ago. So, um, you know, that includes uh, Wired, uh, Wired.com, which actually just turned on their Workbox PWA, I think it was last Friday, um, which maybe doesn't mean as much depending upon when you're listening to this, but basically in early January. So you get that by default right now if you go to Wired.com. Um, Pinterest has had really great implementation. They're using parts of Workbox. Um, Tinder, which I have been a little less involved in. Uh, I'm not an active Tinder user, but I know that they are using um, Workbox and for their PWA. And probably a bunch of other folks that I either I'm not sure that we can talk about or I'm not sure, just don't know about. It's one of the joys of kind of having deployed this open source project is that you never really know who's using it until after the fact sometimes. Just a few small companies then. Yeah. You, you, you know who's not you know you know, you know who's you know who's not using it though, Jeff? It's always the CEO of the company that you're trying to develop the thing for. That's the person that's never using the right tool. So uh but but anyways, um this uh I actually wanted to ask about uh like the next potential release for Workbox, but I I mean I feel like V3 just came out, so I don't know like I'm sure there's plenty of tech debt and re-architecting you already want to do, but um, can you maybe just kind of give us some light on timelines and when you think that'll happen? Sure. Um, so the timelines for like the final V3 release, um, you know, it's currently fairly early in January and we're, we're shooting to move through the alpha and beta to a final V3 um, by the end of the month. And that's kind of our goals. So if you're listening to this and it's still January, um, please try out our alpha and beta releases. Give us any feedback that you have because um, you have a chance to you know, influence what ends up making it into the final V3 release. But you know, V3 is not the end for Workbox. We're continuing to devote time and effort into building some new things. Um, hopefully we paid out an awful lot of technical debt just from migrating V2 to V3. I feel like there's been a ton of that. Um, so I think we're in pretty good shape to have a foundation to build off of. Um, 
Matt mentioned one of the ideas that we kind of are floating around for um, kind of post V3, and that's like adding some code that runs in the scope of you know the, the browser itself rather than the service worker to help with um, like the UX around letting people know when there's updates to cache resources and things like that. Um, another idea that is likely to implement be implemented um, is a helper for taking streams of um, data and then composing those together into a final response. So if you have like multiple smaller pieces of your HTML that can be cached separately using the cache storage API, and you kind of want to stitch that together with something from the network to pull in some content. Um, we want to make that easier. Um, th this is another case of like taking a Jake Archibald blog post and <laughs> trying to wrap that into um, you know code that the masses can deploy. And um, I think navigation preload is another area where um, it, it's kind of part of the service worker specification right now. It's useful in certain cases, but not necessarily too many people know about it. And it can require a little bit of extra effort to implement. So we want to see if we can make that easier for folks. Um, and then we want to hear from the community, like, you know, people who are actually using Workbox in real world scenarios uh, and figure out what um, you know, what they would like to say out of the workbox, and kind of take it from there. Uh, it's it's nice to see you know the the community involved. I feel like the community involvement has gotten better around tools like workbox because I I feel like it is being starting to integrate in with things that you don't really hear about. I mean, we, we've we used workboxes in context that we can't talk about publicly, but you know, they're on plant floors and inside of industrial places and things and uh, for web apps that used to be native that are there. And, you know, uh, again, these sort of tools make the web better. Uh, the APIs that browser vendors are building, you know, these are that we're building on top of these days. These these make the things better. So it's it's an exciting time. 2018 starting great, guys. Like it's 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 really come together. <laughs> And like to give a shout out to the community as well, like we've had a ton of people like raising issues, raising PRs, giving feedback around V3. So it's, I don't know what's been happening, but it's like, I super appreciate it because it, it's a reassuring that people are using this and then B it's reassuring getting feedback of like, okay, we're, we're on the right track ish, but we need to change these things for your use case. So um, yeah, it's, I don't know. It's been really exciting for V3, just seeing the number of people that are kind of working with us to to change things. Yeah, and I mean, you know, Matt and I are the ones on this podcast, but there's a lot of other folks um, contributing on GitHub, both both other Googlers and then um, you know non Googlers. This is an open source project. Um, we really appreciate some of the contributions, in particular, um, that went towards getting the Webpack plugin developed and um, yeah, I also feel remiss not like giving a shout out to the fact that you know Workbox does solve some problems, but um, you know there are other tools out there, and we kind of feel like we're part of a community of kind of service work. So, like the Angular team just recently shipped something that's really cool, um, kind of their own take on service worker tooling that is integrated really nicely into the Angular environment. Um, you're free to use Workbox if you want, but if this is a different option. Um, I know a lot of folks also are probably familiar with the um, Webpack plugin called Offline uh, Plugin, which does a great job as well. And, um, you know, we're, we're really happy to kind of be part of the larger um, kind of service worker tooling community as well. And amen to that. And actually, Jeff, um, special kudos to you because uh, I remember you gave a really nice shout out to a lot of the contributors, uh, non non Googler contributors, especially uh, on 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 uh, at um, Chrome Dev Summit, and that was really cool. So kudos to you for doing that. Um, so I have a, a one last burning question. I think this is probably going to be our last question today, um, which is I'm curious to see how. Um, you know, all the development and usage around Workbox is is pushing the spec forward um, and or backward, you know, in the, in the sense that you know, are there changes being made? Are there additions being made? Um, like, is, you know, what's coming out of Workbox that we're contributing back to the platform? There's only, well, there's a, there's a couple of kind of anecdotal things there. I think when we were first 
working on Workbox, there were a number of situations, and I, I, I always fondly remember this one where I'd done a, a bunch of testing on the Workbox libraries, and for one reason or another, I think Firefox had this this weird issue, and I could only reproduce it in the tests. And I remember like pinging um, one of the Mozilla issue trackers saying, hey, this is happening, can anyone help? And I remember Ben Kelly eventually tweeting me because he was the engineer working on it at the time was just like, yeah, you've basically derailed me for an entire week trying to figure out what, what is going on and fixing it. Um, so it's kind of nice seeing Workbox in that light of stress testing some of these APIs. Um, but there are also scenarios where people are talking the spec around, especially around cache management. Like at the moment for pre-caching and cache exploration, we're doing a lot of index DB stuff just to track what's going on. Um, and there's discussion around, well, could some of this just actually be baked into the platform instead of um, basically requiring all these these jumps through IndexedDB, which is, I think for me, it's kind of interesting because it means that we can at least give feedback from a, a standpoint of, well, this is how people are using it and these are some of the problems that we're seeing with this approach or not, or these are some of the common patterns that maybe would be worth baking into the platform. Um, but I think the other side of it is once people start just using service workers in general, there's also the performance aspect. Like browsers will start seeing, um, okay, particular websites that do pattern X, Y, Z, we're actually seeing that if we make this change, we improve performance or not. Um, so I, I think we're in more of a position around specs where we can at least give comment in terms of the usefulness of things um, or perhaps guide discussion around where we think would be most beneficial for API changes. Um, but I don't necessarily know how much of that will be baked in versus um, like new features of Service Worker that may actually be more exciting. Um, I don't know. That's kind of my take on it. Yeah, and just to add to that, I think that, you know, Matt and I and the other folks on our team have an interesting job in that um, we spend a lot of time writing code um, and we spend a lot of time, like, you know, going on GitHub and doing all the kind of engineering type things. Um, but an equal part of our job um, is just interacting with the community, figuring out how people actually are using these libraries and then using the underlying primitives and figuring out what the pain points are, figuring out how we could take developer feedback, even if it's not directly related to Workbox, but just like if we're, if people happen to be using Workbox, but they, keep bumping into problem X, Y, Z, you know, it's, it's our job to serve as an intermediary, at least with the Chrome team, and just say, hey, you know, we're seeing a lot of people consider this a pain point, and maybe it's like improving the dev tools, maybe it is changing the service worker spec um, to, you know, do certain things by default in a different way. But, um, you know, there's lots of opportunities to kind of just represent developers, um, and, you know, that that's part of my job I, I really like uh, just being able to feel like um, I'm giving a voice to people out there you know if you're shouting on Stack Overflow and uh, you think nobody's listening um, or on the GitHub issue tracker and you think nobody's listening you know we're trying to listen and we're trying to, to help represent you as well so um, so Jeff and and Matt thank you both so much for what you do I know I said that was the last question and it was I have one last corny joke are you guys ready so ready absolutely burning ready well it's actually more of a comment than a joke so i um i've met jeff several times in person and um we've actually spoken at the same mini like we've spoken at same events as well and uh i always embarrass him by saying hey guys uh have you met jeff he's like saving the universe uh, from global warming and and everyone's like what I don't how he's like an engineer at Google like I don't get it and it's because Workbox helps people use less resources less resources means like less energy usage and less energy usage means less global warming which means Jeff is like a Jeff and all of the contributors to Workbox and service workers are like world heroes so thank you all <laughs> I mean <laughs> Yes. Uh, thank you again, Amal. It is very kind. And thank you I'm to sorry. everyone who helps. <laughs> yes. Everyone who helps. That was so, you guys are, you know, like, so... That was such a roundabout guys, is, way to get back to that. Like, <laughs> well, you know what? And Jeff, no like, 
Yeah, and Jeff like never fails to like turn red about that, but it's true. Like it's it's true and thank you. I'm I'm serious. Like this is such a cool project. It's such a cool primitive, it's such a cool everything. Um I hope people use it more and I hope that we as, you know, engineers get better about educating um, you know, everyone uh, about, you know, how to use this and and why. So, so and and obviously coming on the podcast is a wonderful step towards that evangelism. So, yay. <laughs> well, we really appreciate it. Thank, yeah, thank you, thank you, so you much for that. And, I mean, congratulations, congratulations on the 150th episode. Oh, way. yeah. <laughs> um, I'm an active listener, and it, it's really great what you all are doing. Well, well thank, thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. We, 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 would not be able to have a, we would not have a show unless, you know, wonderful engineers and developers like yourselves come on. So we, we greatly appreciate it. Uh, and we have to, we'll have to have you back when you guys release three and you guys can tell us all about the things that, uh, you know, Workbox 3 brings to the table as well. And we'll dive more into it because as far as I'm concerned, you can never talk enough about service workers, which some people will disagree with me with. I, I would disagree with you on that. but <laughs> <laughs> So unless... I think you're correct. <laughs> Oh, good. See, there's always debate at the end of the episode, which leads us to more episodes. Panel, is there anything... Uh, is there any more any more things we should cover before we round out episode number 150? Not for me. <laughs> Matt, Jeff, still if people want to find you online. still laughing at my awesome show. If people want to find you online, Matt and Jeff, where would they go to find you guys? Uh, I would say my Twitter handle, but it's absolutely ridiculous, which is gauntface, just at gauntface, all one word. I, I, I'm at Jeff Posnick. Um, I would say that you know if you want to learn more about Workbox, if you want to um, find out about our community meetings, um, and just you know find out announcements and things like that, we do have an at Workbox JS Twitter account, um, which is kind of the official communications channel. I'd recommend folks you know um, follow that, and you know we're on GitHub, we're at you know, GitHub.com/slash. Google Chrome slash Workbox um, if you wanted to follow the project there. Fantastic. Well, again, thank you guys for coming on the show. Amal, Leon, any final words before we close out? Just thank you to everybody who's listening. Thanks so much for having us. Thanks all. Cheers. And this has been episode number 150 of the Web Platform Podcast. Today we've been talking about Workbox with Jeff Posnick and Matt Gaunt. We hope that this first episode of 2018 leads to a wonderful time of development for you as 2018 begins to start and you build all the wonderful things for the web. We hope to join. We hope to have you next week where we'll talk to more wonderful engineers and developers about what's going on on the web. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your week. <laughs>